Hello, uh, welcome to part two of two of our notes from chapter one on the scope and language of thermodynamics. Uh, in this set of notes, we'll look at uh, some concepts from uh, molecular thermodynamics. And so I'll start out by emphasizing that this is not a class in molecular thermodynamics. So where our motivation comes from is in the last set of notes, we mentioned that 40 to 70 percent of the capital and operating costs of a given chemical process is in separation processes. Separation processes are rooted in uh, thermodynamics. Okay? So if a chemical process constitutes 40 to 70 percent of our capital and operating costs for a plant, any small improvements that we can make can have a huge impact. Those processes are rooted in thermodynamics. And so the general idea is, is if we can understand what's happening at a molecular level and use that to interpret our observed macroscopic behavior, uh, that can help us to rationally design more efficient chemical processes. Okay? So if I, say, for example, um, was trying to separate a binary mixture, if I knew what was causing those two components to form an azeotrope, it could help me better choose an entrainer to try and break a said azeotrope. And so uh, to start our discussion, we'll think back to your general chemistry class. So in general, general chemistry, you should have had discussions about ideal gases. Right? And so what is an ideal gas? Okay. An ideal gas is a system in which molecules don't interact and don't take up space. So an ideal gas is a system in which molecules don't interact and they don't take up space. Well, we know that molecules exist. Molecules do interact and they do occupy space. And so, you know, where we're coming at for molecular thermodynamics is we want to try and understand molecular principles to help us understand and predict bulk macroscopic behavior. Main motivation being is if we can understand at a molecular level and use that to interpret this bulk macroscopic behavior, that it can hopefully ultimately allow us to design more efficient chemical processes. So as far as intermolecular interactions are concerned, um, so all molecules interact to a certain extent, okay, some more than others. Uh, so even noble gases interact via induced dipole interactions. Okay. So dispersion interactions, uh, so you may have heard dispersion interactions called before uh, London dispersion interactions. Uh, London being the person that first derived their quantitative form um, using perturbation theory uh, and quantum mechanics. Okay, so London uh, derived um, said result uh, using perturbation theory on uh, two hydrogen atoms that the interaction energy between uh, two species I and J scales as uh, interaction distance to the negative sixth power. Okay, so um, U would co is corresponds to my interaction energy between um, sites I and J. Okay, and that interaction energy is proportional to one over their interaction distance uh, to the sixth. Um, so as distance increases, the molecules, you know, feel each other less and less, and that magnitude of that quantity decreases. Okay? Uh, the closer they are together, uh, the more strongly they can uh, interact. So all molecules uh, occupy space. Um, so you can think about excluded volume. Uh, if I were to picture a molecule, say, as a playground ball, a rubber air-filled ball, right, I can uh, squish it a little bit. But as I put more and more uh, force on it, I can only deform it so much, uh, at which point I can't uh, you know, press it anymore. Right? And so molecules are, in a sense, kind of like this, and that they occupy space, and that they're going to have this you know, hardcore uh, kind of uh, uh, volume uh, that I can't, um, you know, it's just naturally there. Okay? Uh, so again, this is not a, a course on uh, intermolecular interactions. And we'll look at some example questions at the end of the set of notes to give you an idea of, of where we're going with all of this. So in terms of describing uh, dispersion plus excluded volume interactions, a common model to use is a Leonard Jones potential model. Okay. So um, London uh, told us that this interaction energy uh, Uij would scale as um, 1 over uh, Rij to the 6th power. Okay. And so in our uh, Leonard Jones potential model, all right, we have the Uij, okay, Uij is proportional to uh, 1 over Rij to the sixth. This second term here, right, accounts for our attractive London dispersion interactions. Uij is proportional to 1 over Rij to the sixth power, 
Okay, epsilon and sigma are constants, which we'll talk about momentarily. Okay, but in terms of dispersion interactions, they scale as one over r i j to the sixth, uh, which is accounted for by this term here. It's negative because dispersion interactions are attractive. Okay, they're attractive, and so that's going to be a negative uh, interaction energy. Okay. This first term here is meant to account for these excluded volume effects. So the idea is, is that as my interaction energy goes to zero, this term goes to infinity. Okay. So my Leonard Jones potential and the limit that my interaction distance goes to zero, uh, this quantity right here is going to dominate and my interaction energy is going to go to infinity. Okay. That's going to account for the fact that molecules uh, occupy space. I can only push them so close together. Okay. Um, so this is, you know, a, we might call a semi-theoretical model, right? So it tries to bring in, you know, this theoretical concept of this uh, uh, London dispersion interaction, uh, but then you know it has this concept of excluded volume, uh, but ultimately this is uh, empirically based this term. Right? It originates for computational convenience. Uh, this is just this term squared. Okay. Cool. Um, so before we look at a graph on the uh, next slide, um, just two little things is um, epsilon. Okay, it's a parameter. It's going to correspond to my well depth. It has the same units as uij energy. Uh, sigma as my collision diameter, it's going to have the same units as r uh, distance. Okay, so these two terms form dimensionless quantities. This is a dimensionless uh, quantity. And then epsilon has the same units as u. So when we plot it, a common way to plot it is on my y-axis, I plot my interaction uh, energy divided by epsilon. Uh, it's dimensionless. Then my x-axis, I plot the interaction uh, distance divided by uh, sigma ij. Okay, and so uh, this red curve would correspond to my Lj potential. Okay, so the first thing I'll point out is I plot as a reference uh, my y equals zero line. Okay, so we had mentioned that thermodynamics is a, a field of differences. Right, there's no such thing as an energy. Um, we you know, what we're interested in calculating are differences in, in energies, right? And so how we get absolute quantities is by defining a zero in some way, okay? Leonard Jones potential is no uh, exception. So we define um, our zero as being uh, the interaction energy when my interaction distance goes to infinity. So in the limit that rij goes to infinity, uh, way out here, uh, uij goes to zero. Interaction energy goes to zero. Okay, cool. So then as I bring my molecules closer together, right, they begin to see each other and interact via dispersion interactions, and that effect uh, is to decrease my interaction energy. Right? My dispersion interaction is negative, it's attractive. Okay. So cool, so here's my uh, zero, and so to give you an idea of what the zero essentially is, we said that in the limit that my interaction distance goes to infinity, uh, the molecules essentially no longer see each other. They don't interact, right? And that's how we define a uij of zero. Well, in an ideal gas, molecules don't interact, right? So this would be, you know, say, you know, like an ideal gas way out here, an ideal gas in which the molecules don't even see each other. Okay. Then as we begin to bring them together, they begin to see each other. They're interacting via uh, London dispersion interactions, which leads to this negative, favorable interaction energy. Cool. Then we continue to say squish those two molecules together. The energy is going to take off and go to infinity uh, due to this excluded volume effect. Right? You can only deform them so much. Okay, cool. Okay, so this is my Leonard Jones uh, potential. Okay, so if I'm thinking about say liquids and um, gases, right? In a liquid, I'm going to have large interaction distances. Okay, I'm going to it's going to correspond to say sitting in a region say out here on my interaction potential. In liquids and solids, right, my interaction, uh, the interaction distance between my molecules is much smaller. If I just think about molar volume of a vapor phase and molar volume of a liquid, molar volume of uh, a vapor is much larger, right? And so in a liquid, right, the average distance between my molecules is smaller. I'm sitting down here uh, in my interaction potential. Okay, so here's vapors, uh, here's liquids, and then not only that, uh, we see that liquids are going to have lower interaction energies than vapors. Okay, cool. So in terms of our parameters, uh, so sigma, uh, you might call a collision diameter, and so um, what it corresponds to is the 
uh, distance at which my interaction potential is zero. Epsilon's my collision uh, or well depth, and so it's the uh, energy uh, at my minimum. Okay, so they're just uh, parameters. Okay, uh, so this is a semi-theoretical model, and we'll just use it to interpret um, some macroscopic behavior. Before they do that, we're going to talk about our last concept, our last idea, which is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So the idea with the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is that molecules move, right? Except at absolute zero, uh, all molecules move, and the velocity of uh, our molecules, or the kinetic energy of our molecules, is related to temperature. Okay, so the general uh, assumption behind the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is that internal energy, or uh, potential energy, of a molecule is independent of its kinetic energy. So potential energy and kinetic energy are decoupled. So the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution gives us a probability distribution. Okay, so this is the probability of observing a given uh, velocity. Okay, and so our probability uh, is going to be dependent on uh, velocity, mass, and temperature. Okay, Kb is just our uh, molar gas constant. It's probably something that you haven't seen before. So you know R, uh, your molar gas constant, uh, R is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Kb is uh, Boltzmann's constant or molecular gas constant. Okay, and so it's going to have units of joules per Kelvin. So Kb and R are related, they're related via Avogadro's number. Okay, and so we'll look at plots of this uh, on the next slide. Uh, but before looking at that, we can compute expectation values from our probability distribution. So here's expectation value of observing a given velocity. So I call it v-bar, essentially an average or expectation value. And we could compute the average velocity squared. Right? Average velocity squared would be useful because I take the square root of that and I have speed. Okay? But when I look at um, you know, this term, so if I take the square root of that, that's going to give me speed. Okay? What I see is that as the temperature of my uh, system increases, the average speed of my molecules is going to go up. Okay, so as temperature increases, molecules move faster. Um, likewise, uh, when it comes to mass, as the um, uh, mass of uh, you know, the molecules in my system increase, uh, then the uh, corresponding uh, average temperature would decrease. And so where this is, is interesting is if I think about um, water in solid liquid equilibrium, so if I have liquid water in equilibrium with ice, okay, uh, so at coexistence, those two phases are at the same temperature. And what this tells us is that, well, the mass of those water molecules is exactly the same in the two phases. They're at the same temperature. Uh, so the average speed of the molecules in those two systems uh, is exactly the same. Right? Cool. So the next plot, or next slide, we have uh, the plots um, of PV. So this is plots for maxwell Boltzmann distribution and going from uh, low temperatures to high temperatures. Okay. So we said as temperature increases, uh, the average uh, speed increases, or expectation value of our speed increases. Okay. And so um, what this is showing is that as temperature increases, uh, our probability distribution becomes broader, right? our standard deviation increases. As temperature decreases, the average speed is going to uh, decrease, uh, and what we find is that our uh, peak uh, narrows. Okay. Cool. Right. Excellent. So with that, um, let's look at a couple of uh, sample problems to kind of test your um, you know, molecular thermodynamic knowledge and give you an idea of, hey, you can do this. You are a molecular thermodynamicist, and you don't even know it. Okay. So evaporation of ammonia. A sample of liquid ammonia is completely evaporated, changed to a gas in a closed container. Which of the following diagrams best represents what you would see in the area of the magnified view of the vapor. Okay, so this first beaker, okay, this is a closed system. I have liquid ammonia on the bottom. Okay, I have a vacuum up here on top. Okay, and if I could zoom in on my liquid ammonia, here's what an ammonia molecule looks like, and here's all, you know, the ammonia molecules within, you know, that little magnified view. Okay, so now I have the same container, so the same total volume, but what I've done is I've taken this liquid, uh, and I've you know, maybe increase the temperature uh, uh, so that I've vaporized it. So the vacuum goes away, and now I have the same ammonia molecules, but now they're occupying this entire space. Right? If I could zoom in uh, on that system, what would I expect the molecules to look like? Well, okay, 
here's our picture of liquid ammonia. Okay. What's happening when I vaporize it is I'm just increasing the distance between my ammonia molecules. So the molecules are exactly the same, but the distance between them, on average, has increased. Okay. So what I would expect to see, or the answer is, is A. C, D, and E, all right, I have some sort of uh, chemical change going on. Uh, those absolutely aren't correct. So in a vapor phase, right, I have the same molecules. It's just the average distance between them is increasing. Cool. All right, so now building off of that, boiling water. A mole of liquid water is in equilibrium with a mole of water vapor. Which phase has the higher internal energy? So if I have a vapor in equilibrium with the liquid, okay, um, so a mole of liquid water is in equilibrium with a mole of water vapor. Which phase has a higher internal energy? So does the liquid or the vapor have a higher internal energy? Okay, so these are two phases at the same temperature and pressure. Which one has the higher internal energy? Okay, from the last slide, we said that if I have, say, a liquid and a vapor, in a liquid, the molecules are closer together than in the vapor phase. So if I think about my Leonard-Jones potential, my vapor phase, right, those are going to correspond to interaction energies, say, close to zero. In my liquid, those are going to correspond to interactions happening uh, around my well depth. Okay, So the liquid phase will be more negative. Okay, So therefore, the vapor phase will have a higher internal energy. So if I have a liquid and vapor in equilibrium with each other, it's going to be the vapor phase that's going to have the higher internal energy. C is not correct. Uh, we'll see later on our condition of phase coexistence will be a quality of molar Gibbs free energies uh, and not internal energies. Okay, cool. All right, so just based on your you know conceptual idea of what's happening at a molecular level and having this LJ potential uh, in our head, uh, we know that uh, water vapor is going to have a higher internal energy than liquid water. Excellent. All right, building off of that further. The enthalpy or internal energy of vaporization of a substance is positive, negative, or zero. So is the internal energy of vaporization of a substance positive, negative, or zero? Well, by internal energy of vaporization, what we mean is the change in internal energy in going from a liquid to vapor. So we have a process in which we're going from a liquid to vapor. We're vaporizing a liquid. So if I want to compute the change in internal energy, it's the internal energy of my final state, vapor, minus the internal energy of my initial state, liquid. From the previous slide, we just said that uh, my internal energy of my vapor phase is going to be higher than the liquid. So therefore, internal energy of vapor minus liquid is going to be positive. Right? So just like that, you were able to tell me that the internal energy of vaporization of a substance will be positive. Excellent. So now you know it will be positive, and you have an idea in terms of why it'll be positive. So now if a colleague ever you know, brings you data and they have a negative internal energy of vaporization or enthalpy of vaporization, uh, you can say rubbish, right? And you can even tell them why, okay? So this is what we mean by, you know, molecular thermodynamics. Just like that, all right, without memorizing some passage in a textbook, uh, you were able to tell me that internal energy of vaporization is gonna be positive, all right? Uh, same will be true of enthalpy of vaporization. Um, we'll talk about our P delta V term uh, later on, um, but it's the same thing. Heptane versus hexane. Okay, so what is the main reason that N heptane has a higher boiling point than N hexane? Okay, so from organic chemistry, N heptane is C7 and hexane is C6. So why does C7 have a higher boiling point than C6? Um, so this one is a little more challenging based on wording. Um, so A and heptane molecules have a greater mass. B and heptane molecules attract each other more strongly. C and hexane molecules repel each other more strongly. Uh, and D and heptane is better able to form hydrogen bonds. Uh, well, we certainly know it's not D. <laughs> um, and so the, the basic idea is in C7, I have you know, seven carbons interacting with seven carbons in another heptane molecule. Um, and so it's the fact that I have this, you know, these additional interactions, right? Heptane's just six carbons interacting with six carbons. It's that additional interaction 
uh, which causes uh, these heptane molecules to interact each with each other more strongly uh, and ultimately leads to a higher boiling point, right? They're harder to break apart. Okay, so the answer is, is B. Okay. Uh, very last question, okay, it's related to our Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. The pressure of an ideal gas in a fixed volume container is doubled without changing the number of moles of the gas. The average velocity of the gas molecules will, okay, so if it's a fixed volume container and number of moles is, is the same, so our molar volume is constant. I think about my ideal gas equation state, PV equals RT. So on the left-hand side, I have P times V. V is constant, pressure is doubling. So the left-hand side is being doubled. On the right-hand side, I have uh, RT. Okay, well, R is constant. So if my left-hand side is doubling, my right-hand side must be doubling, temperature must be doubling. And so if temperature is going to be increasing, what can you tell me about the velocity of the molecules in your system? If you said they are increasing as well, uh, then uh, you got the right answer. <laughs> so uh, if I double the volume, I'm going to double the temperature, uh, and then my average uh, uh, velocity is proportional to the square root of uh, T over M. So if mass is constant and T is doubling, um, then uh, my expectation value is going to you know, scale with square root of 2, that scale factor. Right. Cool. All right, and so just like that, you're a molecular thermodynamicist, uh, and you don't even, or didn't even know it. Um, and that wraps up our notes from um, chapter one. If you have any questions, uh, send them my way. Bring them to class. <laughs>